Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome to you to this ISO FDIS 9001 2015 Essentials webinar. This webinar is looking specifically at the new ISO 9001 um, requirements. As many of you, I'm sure, are aware, this uh, 2015 standard is structured around the Annex SL requirements, and Annex SL was covered in an earlier webinar. My name is Margaret Rooney. I'm a regional assessor with NQA, but I'm also assisting our clients and assessors to understand the new standard requirements. The objectives of today are to give you knowledge and understanding of the significant changes in the 2015 standard, an understanding of the new requirements, and near the end, we'll, I'll give you an overall summary of key changes and themes. This webinar is being recorded, so you will have an opportunity after today to listen again, should you wish. You will also be sent a copy of the presentation. We welcome questions and comments. Please use the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Do submit your questions and comments as we go along, and we've allowed some time at the end of this session to address those. Just to remind you that ISO 9001 and all future management system standards will be structured around what's called Annex SL. As I said, we addressed this in an earlier webinar. We addressed it in detail in an earlier webinar, but just to quickly remind you of the 10 major clauses in Annex SL, and hence the 10 major clauses in ISO 9001, we have the scope, normative references, terms and definitions, context of the organization, leadership, planning, support, operation, performance evaluation, and improvement. And in today's webinar, we'll be looking in more detail at the ISO 9001 requirements in clauses 4 to 10. So this will be a clause by clause review. Now, I don't intend, you'll be relieved to know, to go through the standard in great detail. Um, there isn't time, but also you can read this for yourselves, but I'm going to try and highlight the high-level um, issues that you need to be aware of, uh, the, the, the general standard changes. Looking firstly then at clause four, context of the organization. On the left-hand side of your screen, I'll be demonstrating the Annex SL clauses, and they will be in black text. On the right-hand side, I'll be demonstrating the ISO FDIS uh, clauses for 9001. Now, the specific 9001 clauses will be in blue, but where clauses are common to Annex SL, they too will appear in black, I hope this will be uh, reasonably clear as we go along. So clearly we have our overall clause context of the organization. That's much the same in both standards. Then we have the subclause understanding the organization and its context. And likewise in uh, the FDIS of 9001, we have a very similar clause understanding the needs and expectations of interested parties. Again, we have that same requirement in the 9001. Then we have clause 4.3 in the Annex SL, determining the scope of the management system, whichever that particular management system is that we are looking at, and not surprisingly today, we are looking at determining the scope of the quality management system. And again, in clause 4.4, we have a, a generic reference to a management system in Annex SL, which becomes quality management system and its processes in the 9001. Now, this is a uh, first, very obvious um, 
specific uh, item within 9001 that there is enhanced emphasis given in clause 4.4 to processes and that's over and above the Annex SL requirement and that's why you see it in blue uh, print on your screen. So on this slide, on the left hand side, I'll be demonstrating items which are specific to the FDIS which are over and above the Annex SL basic requirement and on the right hand side of the screen I'll be highlighting uh, significant changes or departures from the existing 2008 um, requirements, that's the standard we're currently working to. So. In the FDIS, in the 9001 FDIS, we not surprisingly have specific reference to the fact that we're looking at a quality management system and there is a detailed section on processes in the FDIS. And uh, the, the difference from the 2008 version is uh, in clauses 4.1 and 4.2. Um, context and interested parties are new requirements. You don't see any explicit reference to those in the 2008 um, standard. In clause 4.3 in the FDIS, this is the scope clause, the reference to exclusions has been removed or more correctly the term exclusion uh, is not there. There is provision if you read that clause 4.3 carefully there is provision to uh, declare that certain elements of the standard are not um, appropriate however you need to demonstrate very carefully that by not addressing those particular elements, um, it does not affect the quality of your product or, or service. So um, you need to be very careful, but just something to be aware of. And as I say, say, I suggest you read that requirement carefully, but the explicit use of the word exclusion um, has gone. And of course we have um, reference to quality management system and its processes, that's an enhanced reference in the FDIS. So we have that elevated focus here, um, elevated focus on processes both here and indeed throughout the whole of the, of the standard. So we're moving now to the next major clause which is leadership. And the main difference really uh, between this and the 2008 version is that the emphasis is on leadership, not just management. So top management now have to have a greater involvement in the management system, or should I say, uh, they need to be seen to have a greater involvement. This is not to suggest that top management currently doesn't have an involvement. Many senior people do, but there are instances where they are not so involved and that will have to change with the 2015 standard. So the leaders have to make sure the requirements of the system are integrated into the organization's business processes. In other words, the management system is not just a bolt-on. Again, I suspect many of you are thinking, well, that should always be the case. It should have been the case, but the 2015 standard makes it uh, quite explicit that it's got to integrate into the business processes and that the leaders are responsible for doing this, for ensuring that this happens. And the policy and objectives must be compatible with the context and strategic direction of the organization. The overall theme of this 2015 standard is oriented much more to the business and making it work for the business and that's really quite explicitly spelt out throughout the standard. Some organizations have very clear strategies and business plans and there are many large organizations including household names. If you go onto their websites you can probably see these strategies, business plans, um, vision, mission statements and so forth. In other organizations they are less clear. That's not to say they're not there. 
um, but they're not perhaps clearly spelt out. And other strategies and business plans might be in the managing director's head. So uh, we'll be talking also about the fact that there's less requirement in the 2015 standard for documentation. The documentation requirements are less prescriptive. So from uh, wearing my auditor's hat, I think we may at times have a little bit more work to do in interviewing people, talking to people, rather than looking for documented information. So again, looking at the Annex SL uh, requirements and how that translates into the FDIS requirements and what might be additional FDIS requirements. So on the left-hand side, we have uh, leadership as required in Annex SL, and there's a sub-clause, leadership and commitment, and that carries over into the FDIS. However, in the FDIS, there are two sub-clauses appear, a general one and one addressing customer focus. So, not surprisingly, customer focus is considered very important by the quality profession, so that is highlighted within the FDISC and leaders are responsible, must demonstrate um, that they are customer focused. So this is spelled out in the, in the FDISC. Then uh, there is a requirement to have a policy and again leaders uh, must be playing a very proactive role in having that policy and that carries over into the FDISC and again we see that um, there are some sub-clauses um, here, so we have two sub-clauses developing the quality policy, it being quality specific to this standard, and communicating um, the quality policy. Uh, within many of the subheadings in the FDIS, there is an, uh, an element of perhaps just editorial presentation, and I think the FDIS in introducing in, in a number of places these sub-clauses is just uh, making the requirements a little bit clearer, a little bit easier to read. And then we have 5.3, organizational roles, responsibilities and authorities, and that translates more or less as is into the FDIS um, requirements. So. So far, we see the emphasis on processes and the emphasis on customer coming through in the FDIS uh, more strongly than in the Annex SL. Again, please, if you've got any questions or comments, do type them in as we go along. So as I've already said, the additional subheadings, certainly in this leadership clause, tend to be um, editorial. Emphasis on process and customer, as I already mentioned. So what's changed from the 2008 version? Well, we have emphasis on leadership and engagement. I think these are terms that do not appear in the 2008 version. Um, it's, it's made explicit in the FDIS that, or the, yes, in the FDIS over and above the 2008 requirements that the policy uh, must apply across the organization and must be available as documented information. Um, and throughout the standard and throughout the Annex SL, there's reference made to documented information rather than um, controlled procedures or controlled documents or, or records. Organizational roles, responsibilities and authorities within this, and this is carried over from the Annex SL, there's no mention of a management representative. So this means that the 2008 explicit requirement to have a management representative, that has been removed. However, that doesn't mean you must not have a management representative. Um, organizations that have found it helpful to have a management representative would be wise to keep that role in place.
Just before we move on to planning, um, I'd just like to point out those of you that see our In Touch uh, monthly mailing um, will note that in fact uh, this month uh, we include an article on leadership and this is an article that has been done jointly uh, by ourselves and the Chartered Quality Institute so you might like to have a look at that. Right, we're moving on to the planning clause and it's here that we see again re uh, reference to risks and opportunities. So we do need to be familiar with the concept of risk which is the consequence um, of an event, the associated likelihood of occurrence and how to avoid, eliminate, minimise or mitigate it. And I'll talk a little bit more um, nearer the end of this presentation um, about, about risk, but there is this requirement within the FDIS for risk-based thinking. Some people have become quite anxious about this, but really um, there's no great need to get too worried about it. So as well as being aware of risks, the things that might go wrong, don't forget the positive um, aspects, the opportunities uh, for improving the business and, and how to optimise those, those opportunities. And those risks and opportunities should lead to your policies and objectives or certainly feed into your policies and objectives. And in your future audits against the new standard, that's the sort of thing that auditors will be looking for and asking about. So again, we have our Annex SL requirements around planning and how does this uh, transfer into the FDIS and what do we have in the FDIS that is over and above the Annex SL? Well, we have actions to address risk and opportunities and we have that same, same clause in the FDIS. There's a need to have objectives and planning to achieve them so not surprisingly those translate into quality objectives and planning to achieve them. And then we have an additional requirement in the FDIS over and above the Annex SL requirement and that is a clause uh, called planning of changes and this is another area where the quality profession takes great care and has taken care to incorporate it in the FDIS, um, the importance of changes because change bring, brings risk, not least of which if changes are not properly communicated and we're all aware of the dangers of this then things can go wrong so clearly having a well-defined process for managing uh, changes is important so that's uh, come into the FDIS over and above Annex SL requirements and it's planning of changes not planning for changes so this is um, an interesting emphasis that has come in. So any changes to your quality management system should be managed as part of your quality management system. So what's new in this planning clause um, from the 2008 uh, requirements? So actions to ad address risks and opportunities is a new requirement. We don't have this term used in the 2008 version. In the uh, subclause quality objectives and planning to achieve them there's stronger emphasis on objectives and planning. Now as you know in the 2008 version there is a requirement to have quality objectives but in the 2015 version there is enhanced emphasis, stronger emphasis on not just having those objectives but planning to achieve them. What do you need to achieve? How are you going to achieve them? Who's going to be responsible? What are the deadline dates that you have set? All of that is spelt out more strongly in the uh, 2015 version and as I've already mentioned there's enhanced emphasis on planning of system changes.
Now we move to um, Clause 7, Support, and again we have our Annex SL requirements and there's a subheading, Resources, and we can see straight away within this same uh, requirement in the FDIS, there are uh, further sub requirements, quite a few of them there, people, infrastructure, environment, monitoring and measuring resources and organisational knowledge. So that's uh, spelt out a little more clearly in the FDIS. Then we have um, the requirements around competence, awareness and communication and I think these are themes that are very familiar to us and the requirements I would suspect, suggest are well understood and indeed we have those same requirements coming across into the uh, 9001 FDIS. And then again in the Annex SL we have a requirement for documented information and within Annex SL uh, there's a fair amount of detail around this, general requirements, creating and updating and control of documented information and looked at in total it's not that different from what we already have in the standard around the need for document control. Um, what is not prescribed in the 2015 version is that there should be a manual or procedures or records. You will simply find the generic term documented information. And in the FDIS, we get that same carryover. So, no great difference really between the FDIS and the Annex SL in that respect. So, just to summarize in Clause 7, items that are specific to the 9001 FDIS, um, the resources sub clause is very detailed compared to the Annex SL basic requirement. That was that clause 7.1, which opens out, if you like, into the requirements around people, infrastructure, environment for the operation of processes, monitoring and measuring processes, and a new theme that has come in, uh, organisational knowledge. So those specific requirements there are over and above the Annex SL basic requirements. What's different in this uh, support clause overall from the existing 2008 requirements? Well, there's an emphasis on external as well as internal um, resources, so that comes in uh, both with Annex SL and the 2015 thinking, if you like. Examples of infrastructure are cited in the 2015 standard, that comes in under clause 713. There are more prescriptive requirements for um, the environment, so it's an environment suitable for uh, the operation of equipment, but also you need to consider the environment in which people um, are working, so are they comfortable, is the temperature, humidity um, correct? So you need to think about these things, although precisely what you need will depend on your own contexts. And in general, this support clause 7 covers the existing clauses 6 and 7.6 um, in the 2008 uh, standard, 7.6 of course being the calibration clause and that's covered in the measuring, uh, monitoring and measuring requirement in the 2015 uh, support clause. Organisational knowledge is a new requirement and it's a requirement specific to 9001. So I think this is, this is an interesting one. Um, knowledge can be tacit knowledge, something that's understood, or it can be 
explicit knowledge, knowledge that's captured in some way, formally captured, uh, written down if you like. And the standard gives examples of how knowledge can be um, acquired. We share colleagues, share knowledge, conferences, educational opportunities, they will all add to, to knowledge. Tacit knowledge, any manager um, will know what the individuals uh, that report to him or her, they will know their strengths and weaknesses. So they know the tasks that they can safely give to certain people and the tasks that they wouldn't give to certain people. And that's part of the organizational knowledge, part of how, part of how managers manage. Okay, so what are the items? specific to the FDIS in this Clause 7. So, as I've already pointed out, um, the breakdown of the uh, um, sub-clause around resources. But some further changes from 2008. Um, clauses 7.2 and 7.3 in the 2015 version are um, addressing broadly what's covered um, in clause 6.2, that's the clause that covers um, competence uh, in the 2008 version. Uh, however, the requirement in the 2015 version, this requirement has been extended to include outsourced personnel. So we need to be concerned not just about the competence and awareness of our own people, but also uh, the people who are uh, responsible for Carrying out some of the uh, carrying out the outsourced processes that are critical to our products and services. So everyone, internal and and outsourced, must be aware of the policy and objectives. Communication in the 2015 uh, version is more prescriptive than the 2008 version and includes reference to external communications as well as the internal uh, requirements. And as I've already uh, mentioned, um, the term now used, and this carries over from Annex SL, this is documented information, there's no mention of manual procedures or records, so there's a, uh, an important um, change of terminology there. Moving now to Clause 8, Operation. Um, clause 8 is really um, the core of, of what an organization exists to do, the core processes and how they are managed. Now, in fact, this is a short clause in Annex SL because Annex SL it really has to be quite generic. It's, it's trying to address the requirements of many sectors. And so it's here that there's greater scope for individual sectors to incorporate their own requirements. And the quality profession has certainly taken advantage of that because this is quite a massive clause within the FDIS. It runs, in fact, to several pages in the FDIS. Now, um, I don't do this very much, but I've reproduced verbatim, or will reproduce verbatim here, the um, 8.1 clause from Annex SL because in fact it carries over into um, the FDIS, this 8.1. So you can read there, the organization shall plan, implement, control processes needed to meet requirements and to implement the actions determined in 6.1. 6.1, just to remind you from the planning clause, is actions to address risks and opportunities. So we've identified our risks and opportunities. How are we then going to manage our core processes to um, address those, to control those? So there's a range of things that we need to do. Establishing criteria for those processes, implementing control of the processes, keeping documented information 
to the extent necessary to have confidence that processes are carried out um, correctly. And again, we have a reference to changes. We shall control plan changes and review the consequences of unintended changes, taking actions to mitigate any adverse effects as necessary. Actually built into that are references to risk, and I'll make that a little bit clearer as we, uh, a bit later on. And not forgetting our outsourced processes, which can be quite critical to our operations. So the organization needs to ensure that outsourced processes are also controlled or under its control. And just reminding ourselves there that uh, clause 6.1, actions to address risks and opportunities. So in clause 8, we have a direct carryover of the uh, generic clause 8.1. And then we now have our blue text, which shows that the following items are specific to the 9001 FDIS. So we have requirements for products and services, starting with a subclause, customer communication. Not surprisingly, the quality profession is very concerned about the customer and keeping the customer focus. We need to determine requirements related to our products and services. We need to review those requirements. We need to be thinking about how we manage changes to those requirements. Um, in truth, although this clause 8 is a very big clause, there's nothing really terribly new in it. Um, it its requirements, I would suggest, are already very familiar to us. There's just perhaps within the 2015 standard, within the Annex SL requirements, there is an element of repackaging of the requirements rather than any significant changes. So we then within this uh, Clause 8 have, if it's relevant to your activities, we have the design and development of products and services and that in turn breaks down into several sub-clauses, uh, general setting of the scene, design and development planning, design and development inputs, controls, outputs, and changes. My advice is even if you don't do design and development, do have a look at that clause 8.3 because we have the process approach built into the 9001. I believe, and this may be just a, something of a personal view, but I believe in clause 8.3, the process approach is actually spelt out very well, albeit it's written around design, but change design and development to any other process you like, and I think you have a nice statement of uh, what a process should be and the control around that process. So we've got our planning, our inputs, our controls, our outputs, our managing of changes. So I do strongly recommend that you have a look at that. Then we have control of externally provided processes, products and services. Um, I have had some queries around, you know, what's happened purchasing in the FDIS. Well, it's actually encompassed in the controls that we have around externally provided um, products and services. That's where your purchasing controls would, would come in. So within that, we have the general requirements. We have the type and extent of control that we, we need, type and extent relates to criticality, that would relate to the level of risk. So we actually have our risk-based risk thinking built in there. We have um, information for ex external providers. Communication with our external providers is very important. Production and service provision. We need to control that. Identification and traceability. Again, I don't think there's anything terribly new here. As quality professionals, we work with this all the time. 
property belonging to customers or external providers. Um, we're certainly familiar with um, uh, customer supplied property, I think is the term, but um, with increasing use of outsourcing and perhaps increasingly outsourcing being delivered within your own premises, um, within your system do take care of your provider's property as well as your customer's property as well as your own property of course. Preservation, we already have that requirement in the 2008 standard. Post-delivery activities again, nothing terribly new there from the 2008. Control of changes, very familiar to us all and the importance of that. Release of our products and services, again, nothing terribly new there. And control of our non-conforming um, outputs. Now, non-conforming outputs here, this is you know, the direct containment action that we need to take. Something has gone wrong with the product or service at that point in time. What do we need to do to immediately correct that, to prevent it reaching the the customer. I think, and you can, if, you, if you, those of you that have studied the DIS and are interested in studying the changes between the DIS and the FDIS, I think, and it's something of a personal view, I think there's been some softening of the language in clauses 7 and 8 of the 2015 um, standard and I believe this makes the standard more business friendly, customer focused and, and it just it just reads reads better. So that's certainly uh, a change that I've observed. So in general, within clause eight, uh, really the largest clause I think in this FDIS, it's very detailed, very clear. I think if you read through the requirements, I don't think they present any great difficulties, partly because they're well written and partly because a lot of it is already very familiar to us. It's presented in a more business-like way, sets out design as a process extremely well in my view, and of course it sits nicely in our quality management system comfort zone. And it's largely addressing the 2008 clauses 7, which is product realization, and 8.3, control of non-conforming product. So as I say, it's largely just, a, I think, an exercise in repackaging the requirements rather than any, anything terribly new there. Again, do submit your questions and comments in the, in the box contact box. Right, performance evaluation. So we're moving on now. If you think of our plan, do, check, act, we're into the check part of the PDCA cycle. So having carried out our doing activities in Clause 8, uh, we check our performance and within uh, Clause 9 there's a list of uh, evidence that uh, needs to be in place and these are familiar to us. We need to do some monitoring, measurement and evaluation. We need to do internal audit and we need to do management review. And this is an Annex SL requirement. It's really lifted straight out of Annex SL. Evaluation is a new term, a new requirement in 9001. It's already, it's a term that already exists in the 14001 standard and it comes to us now through Annex SL. And evaluation is about reaching judgment, judging whether a set of data, a set of information, um, is it right or is it wrong? Is it, is it acceptable? Is it not acceptable? And I think it's allowing for context. Certain results might be acceptable in one context and not acceptable in another. And that's where our judgment, our evaluation uh, becomes important. So that's um, a new, fairly new concept in, in, in the 9001. 
Looking at the requirements for internal audit, there's not much change really from the 2008 requirements, but there's extended requirement or extended em uh, emphasis on in ensuring that you include in your internal audits your customer feedback process, organizational changes, and your quality objectives. You might say internal audits should be including that already, but uh, it's made more explicit in the 2015 standard. Management review, really no significant change from 2008. So looking again at the Annex SL requirements and any differences that might have come in to the FDIS, monitoring measurement analysis and evaluation, that carries over into a clause clearly of the same name, but it's um, divided down into subheadings. Uh, again, there's an element of editorial presentation around this, but also customer satisfaction. Any reference to customer is specific to 9001, so that 9.1.2 will be specific to the 9001 FDIS. Then we have um, the internal audit requirements, which again, no surprise, we have that in the FDIS and no additional requirements in internal audit. Um, management review, again, um, carries over into the FDIS. And again, this is just, I think, editorial in the 9001 FDIS. We have that clause broken down into a general introductory uh, clause reference to management review inputs, management review outputs. So otherwise really nothing terribly new there. So looking specifically at the FDIS under performance evaluation, we have, as I've already mentioned, the additional emphasis on customer satisfaction and the fact that our evaluation is to improve the QMS, the quality management system, as opposed to any other management system. And actually within the FDIS, we do have some additional requirements around management review um, to consider customer satisfaction, which already exists in the uh, 2008 requirement, external providers, process performance. So those um, are um, over and above the Annex SL uh, basic requirements. So as I've already highlighted, what's different in performance evaluation from what is currently expected in 2008? Well, there is this enhanced emphasis on evaluation, evaluating our results in addition to purely measuring them and, and analyzing them. Monitoring should be based on risk. Now, again, you might say, well, that was always inherent in the 2008 and even earlier versions, but it's made explicit in the 2015 version that uh, the, the monitoring we need to do should be based on risk. And an interesting uh, change in emphasis looking at uh, customer feedback or customer perception it should now include uh, soliciting perceptions about the organization itself as well as its products and services. I think it's probably fair to say that the 2008 um, emphasis would be on the product and service, but what about you as an organization, the organization as a whole? What do you like to deal with? So um, there's, there's an explicit requirement there. The terms preventive action and statistical techniques are no longer referenced in performance um, evaluation. That's not to say you don't need to do them or use them, but they're not explicitly spelt out in the 2015 um, standard. So no changes on this left-hand screen, but just some further um, changes to note from the 2008, the existing standard, there is no explicit requirement for a documented procedure for internal audit and management review. 
so no explicit requirement. There is an explicit requirement to have documented information as evidence that you have done these things, but there's no explicit requirement to have a documented procedure. Again, that's not to say don't have documented procedures for these things. You may well find it very helpful to have a documented procedure. You will have documented procedures at the moment and may well find it very helpful to uh, keep, keep those. Right, moving to clause 10, the final clause um, improvement, and this is where we're closing the loop of the Plan Do Check Act um, cycle. And this is where we uh, look at non-conformity and corrective action generally, not just you know for the one-off products and services, but looking at our trends in these areas and uh, how how they can help us to improve. And there's also a requirement for continual improvement. And again, I would suggest that the requirements here are familiar and well understood. What about preventive action? As I've already mentioned, this term doesn't appear. The very act of having an effective management system, particularly a management system with an emphasis on risk-based thinking, that in itself is preventive action. So that's why that explicit requirement has been removed. So, looking on the left-hand side at the Annex SL clauses and on the right-hand side for the FDIS, we see straight away, actually, there's an additional general clause in the FDIS which does not appear in Annex SL. So, that becomes 10.1 general and then 10.1 non-conformity and corrective action, that becomes 10.2 in the FDIS, but there's really no difference between the Annex SL and the FDIS requirements in this respect. There is a requirement under Annex SL for continual improvement that carries over directly into the FDIS as 10.3. So what do we have that's additional um, to Annex SL? Well, it's this clause 10.1, and I've just reproduced it here. Um, so it's saying that we need to determine and select opportunities for improvement, implement actions to meet customer requirements, and enhance, succeed customer satisfaction. So this would include improving our products and services to meet requirements and, and indeed future needs and expectations, correcting, preventing or reducing undesired effects. I'm sure this is all very familiar territory to you. Improving the performance and effectiveness of the quality management system. And really what's happening here is that in introducing this additional clause 10.1, the quality profession is emphasizing the importance that it places on improvement and proactive improvement. And then within the standard, within the FDIS, uh, there's explicit reference to improvement can include corrective action, continual improvement, breakthrough change, innovation, reorganization. These are all initiatives that can lead to improvement or take, take place in order to uh, bring about um, improvement. So this 10.1 is additional uh, over and above Annex SL. What's changed from the 2008 version? Well, within the 2015 FDIS, there is the need for proactive improvement, which must be sought. And again, I've just repeated there, uh, the sort of improvements, the sort of initiatives that we might take um, to do that. So that's just an enhanced emphasis from the 2008 requirements. The explicit requirement for a documented preventive action procedure has gone for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. A risk-based management system is a preventive action in itself. So that was a quick run through clauses uh, 4 to 10 in the FDIS. 
let's just look at some uh, changes in emphasis and terminology throughout the FDIS. Well, again, sticking with our color coding, black print for Annex SL, blue print for the FDIS. We have the concept of the context of the organization that's come in with the new standards. Process approach and risk-based thinking. The, these are new concepts or new to the uh, 9001 FDIS. Then we have the requirements around leadership, planning, strategic direction, the term documented information. These come to us through Annex SL and these are new terms to the management system standards. Organizational knowledge and externally provided products and services. This is terminology and concepts specific to the FDIS. And then there's a table here key changes in terminology. I'm not going to go through this in detail. You can study this when you receive the presentation. But just some changes. The term supplier, for example, is used in the 2008 version. That becomes external provider in the 2015 um, version. Purchased product uh, becomes externally provided products and services or outsourced processes. And then we have terminology that is no longer used, exclusions, management representative, quality manual, these terms do not appear in the 2015. And again, at the bottom, we have leadership and risk terminology that is not used in the 2008 standard. I'd just very quickly like to um, look at process, risk, and organizational knowledge, because these are um, important new things that have come in to the FDIS. So there's a, a clause 0 0.3 within the FDIS called the process approach and it makes reference to the plan, do, check, act cycle and it also highlights risk-based thinking. Risk-based thinking needs to be applied within the FDIS. So our process approach should ensure consistently meeting requirements, should give us added value, should give us effective process performance. We're getting a change in emphasis from procedures to process. So the emphasis is moving away from compliance to procedures to effective processes. This is an important change in the 2015 um, standard. And within our processes, we need to consider risk. And we have there a very simple process flow, starting with our requirements, inputs, operations, outputs, leading to our products and services. And superimposed on that, at various points, we need to consider risk. We may not be explicitly thinking risk, but an awful lot of what we do in management systems is about identifying and managing risk, even if we're not explicitly thinking that way. So this risk-based thinking, it has in fact been implicit in earlier versions of the standard. Preventive action is a mechanism for identifying and addressing risk. So Within the 2015 standard, we need to plan and implement actions to address risks and opportunities. The definition of risk, it's the effect of uncertainty and any such uncertainty can have positive or negative effects. There are places in the standard, in the 2015 standard, where there is quite explicit reference and explicit linkage between process and risk. This is particularly so in uh, clause 4.4.1, where we have the cross-reference to um, the planning clause actions to address risks and opportunities. However, just because the word risk is not always used throughout the standard, there are other terms and phrases which amount to consideration of risk. Is appropriate to context. These are 
words that are, these are terms that are hinting at consideration of risk. Potential impact on the conformity of product, that's a very clear risk-based statement. Objectives shall be relevant to conformity of products. The objectives need to be relevant to the level of risk uh, that is posed to the conformity of products. Potential consequence of failure is another way of saying risk to the product. Ensuring there is no adverse impact on conformity, again, that's a statement of risk. Now, again, I'm not going to go into this matrix in great detail, but simply to say I think this is a very, very uh, helpful uh, matrix. I have to say it's not one uh, put together by me, it was put together by a colleague, but it's extremely uh, useful and I think helps us to understand, to grasp the risk-based thinking. So you see over to the left-hand side of the matrix, we have the familiar terminology, um, the familiar subjects within our quality management system standard. We have the clause references. But what I'd really like to draw your attention to is the terminology in the top row over to the right-hand side. We have terminology, explicit reference to risk in certain clauses, but there are other terms, comple complex or complexity, impact, effect, likelihood, consequence. These are all risk-related terms. And you will see from this matrix that references to risk and references to terminology associated with risk are peppered throughout the standard and this is the basis of our risk-based thinking. We've always been doing risk-based thinking, we've perhaps not always been aware that that's what we've been doing but a lot of that terminology already exists in the 2008 standard so we're doing it already, it's just been made more explicit in the 2015 version. Organisational knowledge this is well defined in the resources uh, clause 7.1. It's specific to the organization. Gained by experience, can be gained by experience, gained from internal as well as external sources. Right, I've had the temerity to suggest that in the 2015 FDIS there are changes and there are significant changes. So again, you may not totally agree with me on this, but changes would be reduced emphasis on documentation, no explicit requirement for a management rep, no explicit reference to preventive action, and in general, new terminology. Significant changes, I think, that are going to I hope, I think, make management systems, quality management systems um, add more value and be more relevant to the business is the elevated focus on the process approach and the risk-based thinking, not forgetting opportunities that that may bring. So, in summary, the new requirements overall Annex SL has had a huge impact, clearly, on the uh, standard and how it's structured. Enhanced emphasis on the process approach. Enhanced emphasis on risk-based thinking. Introduction of the concept of organisational knowledge. And the emphasis on leadership as opposed to management. So that's all that I want to say today. Um, we have a couple of minutes left and um, I can address questions and discussion points now. Just to remind you, this has been recorded and you can listen to it again. And we've had a few questions come in. John Scar asks, how does, the 20, how does 2015 impact on financial um, departments? I think, John, that's going to be up to your organisation, the context of that and, and how far, if you want the 2015 standard to apply to your financial departments, if you want to 
consider financial risk as part of your risk-based thinking. Um, it, it's really up to you, I would suggest, in the context of your organization. Um, if you're still unclear, what I suggest you do is have a, uh, have a chat with your assessor on this because your assessor will understand your organization and the context of it. Is Annex SL, sorry, Catherine, Catherine Johnson asks, is Annex SL a separate document that one would order? Um, it's an annex, Catherine, within a very detailed um, ISO directive, so I wouldn't, in fact, the ISO directive is available online. I was able to download it myself from the ISO website. So you can do that, and then buried within that is Annex SL and its requirements. So you don't need to purchase it as a separate uh, document. But if you're interested to look at Annex SL and get a, you know, a wider understanding of the context in which it sits, I would strongly recommend that you, you go to the ISA website and, and uh, download it. Um, again, Catherine uh, asks another question, when making products to customer design, changes even if improvement would not be allowed, would a way to demonstrate Section 10 requirements be to discuss and design improvement suggestions with the customer? Yes, is the short answer, most, most definitely. I, I, I think I know what your meaning is, that within your design process you may feel constrained, but by way of spotting improvements for your customer, I think that's a discussion you need to have with them. So, yes, and that would be a nice example of that Clause 10 um, having the impact it's designed to, which is to make us think proactively about improvements. Can you still use terminology? Um, I think, sorry, Janet Seymour says, can you still use terminology in 2015 even though it's not referenced to anymore? Most definitely, most definitely. It's your system, it's your documented system. You use whatever terminology is relevant and useful to yourselves. John Howell, hello John, says, Please, can you clarify NQA's expectations with respect to the level of training and or competency required for the people auditing, A, auditing, and B, generally training on the revised requirements within an organization? Well, John, we do have a fairly detailed program of training for our auditors and our um, associates. Um, not surprisingly, uh, UCAS, our regulator, is watching us closely on this. IRCA also has specified uh, what it expects of auditors in future on this. Um, so certainly all NQA's auditors will be uh, trained in the new requirements. And this isn't something that's going to happen overnight. There's going to be a period of us all learning and gaining experience of the new standard. Training on the changes, we already have, if you're interested, we already have a transition course, a one-day transition course on the changes, if that sort of thing was of interest to you or your, your colleagues. But as always, um, if NQA at this present time, you're, you don't perceive that we're offering what you feel the training would be useful, do let us know and we'll see what we can, we can provide. Marty Gibson asks, I can see where the term risk can be broadly interpreted by an auditor. Where risk is determined, the, where risk is determined, I think you mean in the organization, how is it possible to defend, if you will, risk within an organization during an audit? Uh, if I understand your question, Marty, you're saying, uh, might I have to de defend my definition of risk to my auditor? Um, yes, you may well have to do that, but I would see that as a normal and healthy part of the audit process. By all means, defend it. Have a conversation. 
uh, I would hope it doesn't turn into an argument, but certainly have that conversation um, with, uh, with your assessor during, during the audit. In the end, it's your system and you understand your risks. Neil, Neil Fern says, will any of the changes from 2008 be considered major non-conformances by CBs? Um, I find that hard to answer, Neil. I think I'll use the old get out clause, which is it all depends. It all depends on the precise issues and on our old friend or our new friend, whichever way you want to look at it, context. Um, I can't give you a blanket answer, but following your question, I will go away and think about that one because it's a good question. D, D Gill asks, with no prescriptive mention of a manual procedures and records, does this, does this give us the scope to create our own versions of these documents? Yes, it does. This lack of prescription gives you greater flexibility in how you want to manage your documents and what structure you want to give your documents. Do read the standard carefully because in some clauses it will be very clear you must have documented information. In others it will say, um, in effect, um, if you need um, documentation to be sure to, to have it. Wayne Dar Darwint asks, when is, the, when is the earliest an organization can be certified to the 2015 um, 9001? Um, the earliest would be when we get our UCAS accreditation, which we're expecting to get um, <clears throat> UCAS accreditation to the new standard, which we're expecting to get um, very soon. The standard itself is due to be published this, this month, so in theory, after publication of the standard. If you're interested, um, Wayne, in um, transitioning fairly quickly, I would suggest you give us a call and discuss your your needs because if you want to do this fairly soon we will certainly accommodate accommodate that even if it means a special visit if that's your wish that's what we'll we'll do Anthony Earl says nobody likes surveys and questionnaires what are NQA's recommendations for collating data for customer perception well, again, Anthony, it all depends on your organization and its needs and on your context. My recommendation, and I know the problem, I don't like filling in surveys either, so I often ignore the feedback questionnaire myself. Um, but I suspect that you and your colleagues are frequently talking or meeting with your clients on the phone, face to face, whatever, take the opportunity to ask them how things are going. You, you, you can talk to them, get the feedback over the phone, make a note of it. Um, it doesn't have to be any more complex than that, but again, it depends on your context. I would agree if you're a small uh, organization with not very many customers, you may have a small client base, to send them a survey is probably a bit over the top. Talk to them. That would be my suggestion. And I think that's the last of our questions and feedback today. Thank you very much indeed. Those were, may I say, very good questions that we've had this afternoon. I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your day and in particular taking time out over lunchtime to